<laughs> All right. Um, okay, so this, uh, this, this presentation really wouldn't have been possible um, without some of my colleagues, uh, Associate Professor Joe Hurley, uh, Chain Sun, uh, Kave Delami, and uh, Andrew Butt, who are all located um, at uh, uh, RMIT University in Melbourne. Um, the website for the project is down at the bottom left, and uh, some of the funding came from the Australian government's Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications under their um, Smart Cities and Suburbs program. Um, we, were, we were really fortunate in getting this grant in 2017, and our original proposal basically was quite similar to the app that Makoto described, uh, Professor Yokohari described in his uh, uh, keynote presentation, which enables um, uh, people to find a cool route uh, going from A to B. And so this presentation is just to talk a little bit about the context of our own challenges that we're facing in Australia and how we uh, design that digital uh, interface. Um, I think the the basic sort of introduction and the um, uh, sort of plan for the talk is really three main points is that firstly heat is going up and greenery is going down in Australian cities. Uh, you'll see in a minute that we're facing quite a significant challenge. Um, at the same time I think we have all of the tools available to us, um, lots of different increasingly detailed data sets, uh, especially around heat and uh, about green space. Um, a lot of that data is becoming increasingly real time. And so there is an urgent need to actually design that information in such a way that it can be used um, by people on a daily basis um, and uh, can be used perhaps even in an emergency situation, for example. And then the third point is just to describe a little bit about the case study uh, from Bendigo in Victoria. So um, just for those of you that aren't familiar with Australian geography, um, I'm talking about the far southeastern corner of Australia, that's in Victoria. And Bendigo, uh, you can see on the map on the left hand side, is located uh, about an hour and a half drive um, around about 120 kilometers northwest of Melbourne, so in an inland area. Um, the first point I was making is that heat is going up in urban Australia and um, it's coming to become a really serious um, natural disaster in its own self. Um, it's well known, for example, that Australia is particularly uh, affected by wildfires or bushfires on a regular basis. Um, and one of the most well known ones in recent years is the 2009 Black Saturday bushfires which um, affected the outskirts of Melbourne uh, in February 2009, and in the course of a day killed 173 uh, people who were unfortunately um, killed um, directly through the fire. Um, but the actual heat itself during that heat event that caused the fire, in fact, epidemiologically speaking, killed 374 people. And you can see why when you look at the graph on the right hand side. Um, this is work produced by some colleagues uh, led by um, Steph Jacobs at the University of Monash. And what's really interesting about this graph is that it shows that the during that single day in February 2009, um, the what was considered thermally comfortable um, was pretty much dominating the day from 8 a.m right through to 8 p.m. So pretty much a 12 hour straight period of very um, challenging heat circumstances. Uh, but what you can see in the graph as well is that the apparent temperature was, was quite low because typically bushfire days, especially the really dangerous bushfire days are effect, um, characterized by very, very high hot winds. So not only is it um, in the high 30s or the low 40s, but also extremely windy. And that would say, well, that's great because of course the wind helps you to cool your body. But um, in this paper, they actually calculate that you need to be um, cooling your body at the rate of around two liters per hour of drinking, which is about the same amount of drinking rate as a marathon runner. 
So obviously that's very challenging for, um, for aged people and for children um, and for those without access to uh, air conditioning. And of course, um, to, uh, heat has a very serious productivity loss. Uh, in 2015, it's being calculated to have a loss of uh, 6 billion US dollars. And yet at the same time, sadly, um, because a huge amount of development occurs in Australian suburbs without um, needing to go through any kind of planning permission or any kind of regulation at all. Um, canopy cover is actually being lost in Australian suburbs. So you can see on this little picture here, which is um, in Western Australia, a typical quarter acre block, uh, relatively small uh, house size of about 120 square meters um, with a big backyard has been replaced um, largely by swimming pools and by hard surfaces. Um, you could almost say that the situation has gone from one where uh, the garden was big enough once to be able to play tennis in, and then uh, the garden has been reduced to the size um, where it's barely big enough to play ping pong. Um, the left-hand side uh, shows that this, we did a review of all local government areas uh, led by my colleague uh, Joe Hurley and actually Steve in his, um, Steve Lisley yesterday in his keynote presentation mentioned this work, how the great majority of local governments actually uh, saw a decline in um, canopy cover. You can see the blue on the left-hand side um, and only a few actually see a rise in canopy cover between 2013 and 2020. And of course, uh, the red lines there show uh, any, uh, various increases in hard surfaces. Um, but increasingly, we have more and more detailed information. But I think, um, such as this one for heat, uh, and this one on the right hand side for um, heat vulnerability. But the trick, I think, for us as um, planners and by academics is how to introduce that information into people's hands in a way that they find as useful as possible. So it becomes a question really about, um, and the urgent need is one about uh, adaptation. Um, it's about providing that information in a way that's very useful to people. And uh, we actually um, assisted the city of Greater Bendigo. Uh, you can see the picture here on the right-hand side um, to uh, design an app um, that was suitable for their needs. And it wasn't just about the app, it was also about the data production process that we went through that I want to emphasize now. So um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Bendigo, it's a population of around 100,000. Um, it gets very hot in the summer, uh, it's very, very dry, um, only annual precipitation of around uh, 512 millimeters uh, per year. So typical um, continental and uh, Mediterranean type of climate. Um, we conducted a review of different kinds of apps that are used um, for route planning and for adaptation to heat. Um, I'll provide you with the reference to the paper in a minute um, here, but you can see how it's certainly not a unique idea. Um, there are different organizations um, from Longevi City in Milan. Um, there's a Paris um, uh, app, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, there's various uh, private providers, um, Walkonomics and Walkspan, for example, that are trying to achieve the same thing. Um, the European Union has, for example, has funded the Extrema app, which enables uh, users to um, uh, adapt to heat uh, using their phones. Um, similarly, there's the city of Paris has provided this uh, map and app service on the right hand side that enables users to identify where there are uh, cool islands um, as opposed to heat islands in the city. Um, and there's uh, the Singapore government provides a park connector network uh, website as well that um, tries to achieve something similar. What we were trying to do was to get people to think about their local environment and to say, wouldn't you rather be walking along a street uh, such as this, which has lots of green canopy, as uh, Makoto was talking about, rather than a street like this, which has much less. And um, we approached this from both uh, from different levels, uh, kind of a quantitative as well as a qu qualitative perspective because um, following Professor Yokohari's talk, 
we recognize that heat is not just purely something of measurement alone, but it's also very much um, it's embodied, it's psychological, it's also even cultural. Um, and so we try to capture that as much as possible by examining what is the meaning of shade and uh, how we can best capture that information. So um, we did various qualitative interviews and focus groups. Uh, we explored the different um, uh, types of shade that exist in Bendigo. Um, we basically were trying to look for different groups of people and how they understand heat and shading um, according to different age groups and uh, different vulnerability levels. In fact, we engaged specifically as part of the design process for the app with um, uh, walking groups um, and with uh, school children. Um, we produced the composite map initially from two-dimensional GIS, um, but then we realized that that wasn't going to be enough. Um, and so we used, uh, we downloaded um, all of the street view images for the city. Um, it's uh, more than uh, 100,000 street view images every 10 meters. Um, and we generated a sky view factor uh, for that. So you can see here um, on the top right of the slide, um, a Google Street View image basically looks like that, like a big ribbon, really, of uh, image. If you wrap it round uh, in a circle, then it produces a hemisphere. And using um, uh, a machine learning, uh, we were able to identify the green areas as opposed to the sky areas, and then was able to automatically calculate how much um, uh, sky you could see at every individual location throughout the city. And the city was able to use that information to be able to say, oh, well, look at this, there's hardly any trees in this neighborhood. Um, it's where people are particularly vulnerable. There's a large proportion of people who live on their own, who are older than 65. Um, we need to plant more trees there. So that's been one good outcome. Um, but we also worked very closely with a small local company based in Victoria. Uh, called POSI, who provide a public GIS system for the city, and they were able to overlay existing information and to produce this route mapping algorithm uh, that shows you on the one hand um, the shortest route in red and the uh, cooler route, but which is slightly longer um, uh, in the middle. And I, what was good in um, Professor Yokohari's talk earlier was that uh, uh, someone asked, well, how many people use it? And um, Actually, we, um, this is not really an app, so it's not a question of downloading the app. You can just view it uh, very easily through a browser on the phone. Um, and you can see that when it was launched uh, in December uh, 2019, um, there's been consistent use, but especially during the summer. And in fact, we anticipate the way the app is designed is that people will have maybe their daily walk that they will use. Um, and uh, perhaps maybe a walk to school or a walk to the shops or a dog walk. And they'll be interested just to maybe use it once or twice, just to sort of visualize where the coolness might be. So it's not going, it, we don't anticipate that something like this would be used like Google Maps as frequently as that. And it would be very difficult to actually design an app to sort of try to replace uh, people's use of something like Google Maps, but it's more like an adjunct to Google Maps. Um, uh, we published me, uh, the work. Could you please uh, summarize within a couple minutes or so. Yes, I'm just coming okay. to the ending now. So um, okay, yeah, there's there's more information here um, in these papers. Uh, you can just look them up very easily if you wish. Um, and uh, that's it uh, from me. So over to the other uh, presenters. Thanks very much.